Hello, fabulous Friends fans and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Well, I'm so excited to celebrate with you today, really somebody who doesn't need any introduction, one of our great living legends in astrology, the great Stephen Forrest. Now, Stephen Forrest is the author of so many books, including The Endless Sky, and Yesterday's Sky, and just so many books on elements, and just this prolific writer. And I know that his books, like they did for me decades ago, his books really change lives. They inspire a love for astrology and a love for the way in which astrology and wisdom can connect in powerful ways. So yes, this is a rare treat, and I'm so excited to celebrate with you today. Somebody that now we're talking for the third time on camera, truly the one and only Stephen Forrest. Stephen, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, glowing introduction. I hope I can live up to it. <laughs> I have no doubt. Absolutely. You know, there's so many things I think about when I spoke to you the first time and the second time. And so this third time, I hope we'll keep building on that. I'll be sure to link below the previous interviews that we did together because I think that we covered so much about what you think about astrology and about how you understand your own relationship to astrology as well. Because I know you're a pretty like philosophical, spiritual kind of dude like me. And so let me start there. What was it that you think inspired this sense of spirituality and astrology and the way in which you brought them together in a way uniquely your own? What was that first impetus towards a more spiritual understanding? Looking through telescopes. I have a very, very simple answer for that. Uh, I, I grew up in uh, oh the 1950s, basically, in a fairly conventional family. And uh, science was kind of the basic metaphor for reasonableness. Now, we know science is far less reasonable than it purported to be back in those days. But, but uh, I, my first memory as a, a little boy, almost literally, was wanting a telescope. I hope Santa Claus would bring me a telescope for Christmas. And, and I was so young and so inarticulate that I wasn't able to get across that I wanted an astronomical telescope. So Santa Claus brought me a spyglass, you know, so I could look at naked women in their bathrooms in the apartment across the alley or something like that. And I was pretty disappointed because I wanted to look at the, the other kind of heavenly bodies. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting. How old were you at the time? I, I'm going to guess be, because I was so unable to express myself clearly, I, I was probably four years old five years old. I, I'm a speaking demon, of course, by the time I was six, you know, I was, it was me and Shakespeare, of course, you know, so I was probably four. <laughs> I, I love that. You know, it's interesting because I remember at four years old, looking up at the sky and feeling a connection to the sky, especially to the moon. I mean, that is a connection we see so many children feel when they look at the sky, the moon, the stars, it's like we innately know that we are connected to that. Absolutely. I know a lot of people, I see them comment saying to you, how do you write so many books? How is it possible that every year you have another book? And so let me ask you that first. How do you, like, do you have a system? Do you have a way in which you go about it? How do you end up writing a book every single year? Well, for, for one thing, uh, I, I have not written a, a book every single year. It, it, may, it may look like that. It does uh, depending look like that. on how you count them, I've got uh, 16 books out. Uh, the count gets a little funny in a couple of ways, but that's basically right. And the, the Inner Sky, uh, I got the contract to write that, my first book, uh, just about 40 years ago. It was actually in 1981. It came out in 84. So call it 40 years and 16 books. So rum rumors of my superpowers in that regard are somewhat exaggerated. I would also say that uh, uh, anybody who's reading my books, every sentence represents World War II grade inch per inch over the minefields and the exploding cannonballs. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, writing 
I love writing, but it's hard. It's really hard. It, you you know from the work that you've done, you can sometimes you get in a flow, but 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 mostly uh, you think you're in a flow, and then you look at it the next morning in horror, and you <laughs> back to the blood, sweat, and tears. You know. Yeah. But the flow is addictive, I will say, <laughs> even yeah. though, yes, we have that more critical side that we'll look at it afterwards. But yeah, the flow can be a lot of fun when you're really in it, too. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the the, the satisfaction of reaching so many people, you know, is, is just uh, I don't know how to find words for how appreciative I am of that. But that uh, here's something I can find words for. And I really love to say it. So <clears throat> if somebody somebody writes a book and they never get it published. You know, they can't find a publisher, which is the story probably 90% of the time, you know, because finding a publisher is difficult. You can self-publish and your house is full of cartons for the rest of your life and your mom bought three, you know, the self-publishing is tough unless you really run it like a business. So somebody writes a book and it never gets published and they feel like a failure. I love to talk to people like that and say, you wrote a book, you wrote a book, you know, that's a spiritual victory. That's going to mean something to your soul for, for eternity, you know, so don't be ashamed, you know, be peeved, you know, that the world was too insensitive to appreciate your brilliance. I mean, it's okay. I wouldn't try to talk you out of anger or frustration, but, but feel proud. You know that that you accomplish that. I I love saying that because there's so many broken-hearted authors out there. It is interesting that you describe it as a spiritual victory. You know, I'm reminded uh, when I was an undergrad way back in the day when I was in university. I remember having this epiphany where we were reading Plato again, right? So we had to go through reading Plato again and again and again. And so I had one of these moments where I realized, you know, this person lived thousands of years ago, but it's like he's here. It's like he's still living because of this book. And I remember early on sort of associating books with immortality because I see and see them that way as a little part of us that we give to the universe that lasts well after our lifetime. And so I know there's a difference between writing and being a writer right? There is a difference. And some people might enjoy being a writer a lot more than the actual process of writing, but both are valuable. Both make an impact, whether it is on your own spiritual journey, like you writing yourself, or when you share it really to the world, you don't know how that work will continue to be out in the world and what will that work will have going forward beyond your own lifetime. Exactly. It's like it's like having a kid. You you just don't know where it's going to wind up. You know, maybe some someplace wonderful. And then the hope, yes. Writers versus uh, being a writer versus writing. Uh, I I hear what you're saying, and I would just add a parallel comment that uh, uh, like among rock stars, there are people who love to play the guitar, and there are people who like the way they look in sunglasses. <laughs> Yeah. You know, there, there's something about, uh, you know, I, I'm a writer, you know, that, that flows really nicely at a cocktail party. And there, there are people who kind of like the, uh, the glamour of the identity. They often are not very good writers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, a lot of how we feel about our own writing can be so subjective. But I think it's also like there's this whole school of philosophy that says, um, you as the reader are having an interaction with what you're reading. Like the author may have a certain intention, but once it's out into the world and the reader receives it, so much of how they understand it is going to be based on their own experiences and how they interpreted it and what they're bringing to that moment of reading. And it's powerful to be a part of that process in some way. Absolutely. We're a catalyst for other people's reflections and other people's creativity. And that's that's just really exciting. And then, of course, built into it is, uh, is the scary side of it, that, you know, what we write and what people get out of it can be opposite, you know, can be completely unrelated sometimes. And we'll get folks, you know, thanking me for telling me that 
their chart said that their mother was the reincarnation of Genghis Khan, you know, or something. <laughs> Because that cleared up so much, and it's like I didn't write that, you know. But it, it's it's amazing the the gap sometimes between what you write and what people take away. Okay, so speaking of your books, I know that we don't like to play favorites with our children, and yet, is there like uh, one or two of your books that really stand out to you that you might think are special in some way to you? There, there are uh, about 16 of them that are my favorite, you know, <laughs> as you might imagine. But, but each, each uh, like your kids, you know, each, each in its own way. Um, perhaps the one that came closest to speaking with my own voice and my own values and, and so on, the one closest to my heart, was one of my more obscure ones called The Night Speaks, which was... Uh, there's a lot of science in it, uh, of like objective scientific reasons to believe in astrology. You know, there are all sorts of evidence for that. And, and yet it's not really a science book. You know, there's a lot of once we've uh, looked at the science, we realize it still doesn't explain everything astrology does. And so there's this kind of wider view. So that that book, The Night Speaks, uh, anybody who wanted to get to know me before they met me, probably reading that book would be the closest way. So can we jump into, I would love to know your thoughts. Now, I know you just said it's a four-day workshop that you teach. And so we're not going to be here for four days, that's for sure. But I would love to get just a few of your insights. I think it would be so interesting to ask you and, and get some insight into the age of Aquarius. When do you think it begins and how do you understand it? I think it uh I think it began early in the 20th century. I I I would put it 1903-1905 uh 1903 for the Wright brothers first flight and uh 1905 for the special theory of relativity. You know there as kind of markers. Uh, I know that there will be technical astrologers out there listening to this who are hitting the ceiling, as I say this, because the the, the standard kind of, uh, you know, Mr. or Ms. Science astrologer approach to this is the age of Aquarius, uh, if it means anything at all, will begin in uh, like 2400 A.D. or 2500 A.D. Here's the problem with that. So. In 1928, 1930, around then, the International Astronomical Union got together and established the constellation boundaries arbitrarily. Fine, it's like here's Connecticut and here's Rhode Island, you know, in the sky before that there weren't formal boundaries. Uh, so Sagittarius, when did it turn into Scorpio? Nobody knew, but then they knew. And uh, the Procession of the equinoxes, which defines the cycle of the ages, is often measured like the age of Aquarius begins when when the equinox uh, retrogrades out of Pisces and into Aquarius. But where is that boundary? Exactly where do we put it? Now, according to the scientists, God bless them, they're, the, 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 there are like 13 signs that are on the ecliptic, and they vary a lot in width. And uh, by that standard, we enter the age of Aquarius in another four centuries. But I, I question that standard and ultimately reject it. So I hope I'm not being too windy about this, but it's fascinating stuff. Basic astrology, as above, so below of course, is a way of thinking about it as below, so above. When we're not quite sure what's going on in the sky, maybe we can look at human life and, and from that presume what's going on in the sky. Here's an illustration of that. So we leave Pisces at some point, uh, a more mystical age. We say a lot of things about Pisces enter Aquarius, more rational, more scientific. A classic word for Aquarius is genius. We enter the age of Pisces. Let's think about uh, the birth of Jesus, the birth of Buddha, 
two mystical Piscean teachers separated by about four centuries, split the difference. It's like about 200 BC, something like that, you know, between their births and then run uh, 2,200 years and some forward for each age if they're equal in length. It comes out around the middle of the 19th century. If you split the Jesus and Buddha births, middle of the 19th century, but it's this is quick and dirty thinking. And so I, that's why I kind of move it forward because of Kitty Hawk and the special theory of relativity. And here, here's a line that I use in generations that's just as good as trust the children. <laughs> so get ready for it. Here it comes. We went from Kitty Hawk to the surface of the moon in 66 years. Doesn't that sound like the cusp of the age of Aquarius to you? <laughs> wow, yeah. 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 So that, that's my reasoning with it. And how do you think, since we're, we're kind of getting some of your insights here, how would you define the age of Aquarius? I know you touched on it a little bit so far, but can you talk a little bit about how you see the age of Aquarius as this next level for humanity? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, one thing I'd like to say loudly and clearly before I, I even launch into that is uh, I'm a firm believer in free will and personal responsibility. You know, those two go together. People think free will, yes. I'm not sure about personal responsibility, but of course, they, they really are opposite sides of the same coin. And so I would not be comfortable predicting that the age of Aquarius means the the uh, dawning of peace, love, and understanding. You know, it, it can mean wonderful things. It can mean terrible things, just like Pisces. With uh, individuals, people make choices and they screw things up or they get them right. With humanity, which is what we're talking about here, we, we probably see the whole spectrum. Like uh, in the age of Pisces, this uh, incredible blossoming of of mystical understanding, of spiritual understanding, rooted in Buddha and Jesus and sort of on, on and on through various traditions. And that's glorious. But then in Pisces, there's the sense of uh, dissolving into something bigger than ourselves, which is a classic spiritual metaphor. But then you lower the energy a little bit, dissolving into uh, nations. It's like I am... I am a, I am a Roman citizen, you know, when the Roman Empire and the age of Pisces really coinciding or late, late late Republic and and into the into the empire. And and so we have people in Turkey and people in England, not even speaking the same language, were Romans and dissolving into something bigger. Not bad, not good, but then you get uh all the brutality that comes from dissolving into a nation, taking uh, leave from any kind of personal responsibility. You know, the, the country asks me to do this and we start to get into scary stuff. I think of uh, his simple observation that marriage is way less stable than, than it was historically. I mean, it, it's plainly seen in the age of Pisces. I am dissolving my own identity into this couple. You know, it's like, I don't matter anymore. We matter. You know, you are mine. I am yours. You are mine. I am yours. You could sing that 50 years ago and everybody's got misty eyes. Now it's like, wait a minute. I'm, I don't belong to anybody else. You know, that's the age of Aquarius. And so much more of a focus on individuality. The, the, uh, when I was a kid, there's still a lot of Piscean age thinking. And, and the idea was the world will inevitably dissolve into one world government. Seems like a nice idea. It's a very Piscean idea. We'll all dissolve. You know, we're earthlings. You know, we're not Belgian or French or African or Japanese. You know, we're earthlings. It still sounds like a good idea. But the opposite happened. We have many more nations on the earth now than we had when I was a kid, you know? So this diversification. Now, is this a, like 160 nations all trying to kill each other? That's dark Aquarius. 
160 nations thinking, isn't it cool that we're different from each other? We can be a salad rather than a melting pot, so to speak. I mean, this is obviously a vast subject, but we see this flow in every level of culture and society in the direction of more respect for individual autonomy, more diversity. Uh, the dark side of it is a sort of coldness and separation and even lack of caring about each other. And then the, the higher side of it is, uh, is freedom, just freedom and individuality. We're going to get a, a big taste of which way the wind blows with all this uh, starting very soon as Pluto goes into Aquarius. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you next. I wanted to ask you about that is the huge, you know, transit that is coming up very soon in March of 2023. Pluto is going to step into Aquarius just for a little taste, then retrograde mm -hmm. out a couple months later. And this is happening just to give us that taste. But then as we move further into the decade, we really start this extended transit. In one way or another, we're going to be feeling Pluto and Aquarius for 20 years to come, which is really powerful. So I know you've written extensively on Pluto as well. I loved the book that you had on Pluto. I know it helped me in my journey so much. Can you talk about um, how you understand this transit in particular of Pluto and Aquarius? Perhaps the most important transit of the decade, without a doubt. Um, how would you understand it? How do you understand it? How do you like to explore it? I, I begin with, uh, as, I, as I did speaking of the age of Aquarius, uh, I feel like we can't fully understand it except against the backdrop of the age of Pisces. And, and so we have Pluto in Capricorn now, and it, it's not, not done. In fact, I, I wrote a little essay called Late Stage Capricornosis <laughs> which, uh, is a, about this. And so what Pluto does, one of the things Pluto does, is it brings the shadow to light. To, to say Pluto is an evil planet would be totally wrong, misleading. But that Pluto is the planet that confronts us with evil or confronts us with our woundedness. Everything that makes you squirmy is Plutonian, you know, so that's its nature. So it brings forth the shadow. I, I, I want to be careful not to do the four-day lecture on this one, you know, for mercy's sake. But uh, so Capricorn, uh, Here's a positive statement about Capricorn. Traditional values, like integrity, like if you have a child, take care of the child. Don't fail because you change your mind about having the child stand up like an adult. You know, these, these are sort of Capricorn attitudes, you know, traditional values of character, integrity, personal responsibility, etc. Much that's beautiful about it. But here are some other traditional values, by which I mean values which have had a long tradition. <laughs> I turn it around a little so we're a little more suspicious. Sexism is a traditional value. Racism is a traditional value. Xenophobia, you know, the fear of foreigners, is a traditional value. Here's another one, the idea that uh, God is good, the earth is infinite, and uh, the earth has been given to us, you know, for our delectation to exploit infinitely. We have a right. We're humans. No, we're men. <laughs> I use the old language, you know. We're, we're men, after all. We're not animals. In fact, we can exploit the animals, too, while we're at it, because they're just animals. Now, I don't believe any of this, but they are values that have had a long, long history. Now, under the banner of traditional values, we see some good things and we see some bad things. While Pluto has been in Capricorn since 2008, and it's still there, we have seen the boil busting on these traditional 
values. We've seen an explosion of awareness of them. We've also seen them fighting, uh, I, I think, their last stand in the world. This The dark side of conservatism, you know, has been everywhere. Uh, Capricorn uh, ruled by Saturn, the father archetype. This one gives me goosebumps as we see these, uh, uh, you know, all powerful uh, father figures appearing everywhere. Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Putin, Mr. Bolsonaro, you know, sort of on and on. Mr. Modi in India, you know, people who come up with this this sense of uh, here I represent traditional values and I am uh, in authority. And we find half the population saying, yes, yes, father, yes, dad, you know, and what a mess it's created. We're seeing the shadow side of Capricorn. I think the purpose of this is not just that we suffer, but that we recognize it and we we come to understand it in ourselves. I think we're seeing the the last gasps of sexism and xenophobia, et cetera. You know, I think people are starting to get past that, but we we needed the crisis. We needed the psychiatric crisis of Capricorn. So in that light, when I think of Pluto entering Aquarius, you know, of course, we, we recognize that it would only be a very naive and inexperienced astrologer who who imagined this would only spell peace, love, and understanding. You know, so what's the dark side of Aquarius? Because we're ready to deal with it. I think one thing we'll see. I mean, not to get turn this all into politics, but uh, have we seen the dark side of conservatism, literal political conservatism? Pretty easy question. Uh, will we see the dark side of the progressive movement? You know, we remember that the uh, French Revolution, which occurred with Pluto and Aquarius, was uh, ostensibly a liberal movement, you know, and, and yet obviously the guillotine figured in it after a while. So, uh, I, you know, each each side of the political argument will have its shadow. And I, I think the pendulum is going to swing. It kind of looks good for the liberals, but I hope the liberals are good in, in, in the way they they come to rule the world. That, that would be my guess. Um, the thing that frightens me most, uh, I don't want to build this around fear, but uh, the thing I would be railing against most loudly dark side of Aquarius is just detachment, you know, not caring, you know, the ability to kind of stand back in this airy intellectual way and observe things like uh, uh, people have always suffered, big deal, you know, why should I care? What could I do about it? A sort of dissociative, detached state is a Plutonian expression of Aquarius. And so I I, I think our challenge as conscious people is going to be to keep our, our hearts open in the face of some things that might tempt us to close our hearts because they're painful to observe. I don't mean to be so gloomy about it, but you know, each Pluto always is challenging. It's amazing how Pluto does like turn things over, isn't it? That it, that stuff that maybe we don't want to look at, but actually it is that that very guck that is a driving force. It is Pluto that makes us say, here, look at it, deal with it. And I love how you expressed this idea of greater equality. Perhaps based on what I just heard you say, it's possible that we may get a chance to really look at and heal the guck that gets in the way of us truly experiencing a greater sense of equality and not just in a in a policy sense but really knowing it really feeling it and it's like what you said earlier pay attention to the children look at what the children are doing right you see this in the kids growing up they they don't have that same um hyper awareness around race and religion yeah. in the yeah. same way because whether it's through social media, whether it's through TV, whether it's their own experience, most likely their own experience, they know people of these different backgrounds. And yeah. we're really getting a chance to see how right now that guck of traditionalism has been 
has been, you know, sort of in power dynamics has been turned over with Pluto and Capricorn. Now, Pluto and Aquarius, those of us who need to acknowledge that pain that is ultimately beneath any sort of really ridiculous um, ways in which we separate ourselves from other human beings, ultimately we do that out of pain. And maybe that stirring, it's messy, right? It's messy in our own journey to stir it, but necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Beautifully, beautifully said. I I would add that uh, starting in in March, uh, we're going to have kids born with Pluto and Aquarius. And and that's sort of uh, another dimension of all of this that uh, we get a, oh, you know, like something like uh, like the, the, the Uranus-Neptune conjunction of the early 90s, you know, it was like uh, everybody was talking about it. It's a long time ago now, but we should still talk about it because there are kids born in the, in the early 90s who aren't kids anymore. And, and they have this hologram of, of this new paradigm inside of them. And they are, are now sort of coming online as uh, artists and political leaders and business people and environmental crusaders. And, and so every, everything that happens astrologically has this double meaning. It is what it is in the moment, and it leaves its fingerprints on the moment. But then the thing that's so easy to forget is those kids are born, and and so that transit or whatever keeps on giving for maybe as long as the next century or some something close to that for a for a human lifespan. You know, the the novelist who at age seventy, you know, writes his or her masterpiece, you know, and and it comes out of that. So the Pluto and Aquarius uh, generation, none of them even exist yet on the Earth. But I think the these are the kids who soon enough to be adults who who, who will carry this the sense that you were describing of of sort of a, a post racial post uh binary gender et cetera et cetera kind of civilization i think for them it will be natural all of that will be accompanied by the term of course of course you know whereas for the rest of us there's some sense of struggling between the past and and what we are becoming it's exciting uh i hope this doesn't get you an x rating i'm going to be slightly on the graphic side here uh, I'll start off with uh, an irrefutable observation, which is uh, something like 75% of the astrological audience is female. You know, we, we just see women. And next, the, the moon and the cycles of a woman's fertility are locked in resonance. And I bet that's where astrology came from. The, some woman in the old of I gorge 87,000 years ago, thinking uh, as above, so below, so to speak. Again, I'm trying not to get too graphic about it. And, and the, of all the of all the celestial terrestrial correlations, the cycle, uh, the menstrual cycle and the moon cycle, it's the most obvious. And, and so I really do suspect it was the root observation upon which astrology rested. And uh, women get it, you know, they just get it in their bodies. You know, it's like I'm I, I'm in awe. I'm sort of envious. But of course, I believe in reincarnation, too, which leads me to remember a, a wonderful moment I had with a Muscogee elder from Oklahoma, Indian guy, played football, really tough, totally masculine guy. And he's in front of this class and he looks at us and he says, I am half woman. My mother was one. <laughs> I just found that absolutely profound. So uh, I don't want to overdo the gap between the male and the female experience, but women's bodies are astrological receptors in a way that men can only dream of. And the evidence is clear. You know, just look at the audience. Wow, that's so insightful to consider how it is that feminine receptive side of us that is that much more open to understanding astrological wisdom. I do want to kind of give a shout out because I know that now in our current times, the great thing is, is that more people than ever can honor both that male and female or can honor if it is that they identify as non-binary or however it is that they define that. We truly are in a context right now in the West 
where we're very fortunate that we get to be able to do that because that is not true everywhere in the world. I know for women, women's roles in some places like in the East, very clearly defined. And it is those very qualities of reception that are held up. You know, one of the things that stands out to me with you and the conversations we've had, you know, you were the first person I remember talking to you about this idea of how women are such a huge part of whom it is taps into the power and wisdom of astrology. And I remember we had a brief conversation around feminism in one of our earlier interviews as well. And again, you guys, I will make sure to link to those previous interviews below. But you said something that has stayed with me since I heard it from you 12 over 12 years ago, and that is feminism is good for men. You said that feminism is good for men as well. How do you understand that? Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because oh, I have yeah. a feeling of what that means, but I would love to know more of how you understand that. Yeah, the, the more people who have a feeling for what that means, the better the world is going to be. Um, so uh, just loud and proud, I want to go on record, I am a feminist. You know, I, I've been a feminist ever since I, I could think. But I hate the word feminism. The, the word feminism implies that it's about women. And in fact, it's every bit as much about men as it is about women. The, the liberating of human beings from the conventional gender roles. Uh, I grew up in a generation where we're, you know, it's like, uh, well, you know, I was a hippie. I still am, I guess, you know. So men, we started growing long hair. And and it's like, you know, you look like a girl. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you want to fight about it? <laughs> it was a, a funny combination of, of, of old masculine energies, but also a sort of emulating of, of, of the feminine. And I remember the first time I hugged a man who wasn't a family member. I mean, it was an event in my life to actually hug a man who wasn't a family member. Now, of course, that, you know, the hug has replaced the handshake, you know, the hugs are everywhere. But that's, uh, this was like in uh, probably 1970. And how the, how the world has changed, getting old, of course, you get front row seats for the, the, the rate of, of cultural change. Um, the, the next generation coming up is, of course, uh, taking it a step further, you know, with non-binary kinds of identities, you know, going further than my generation did in terms of, of blurring the meaning of male and female. Uh, I, I've taught a, a program to my students sometimes called Generations. It's a big four-day extravaganza about age of Aquarius and outer planet transits through signs and so on. And uh, one of the themes I love to to harp on in that program there's one one phrase that people think of a tattoo afterwards and it's uh trust the children trust the children it's it's such a powerful line and each older generation has a hard time with it but here's how i like to prove it you know i i talk about before my time in the world you know the 1920s you know i wasn't even alive then and and uh women are are flappers you know and there's a little bit more sex in the air and people are drinking and white people and black people in the same room together and 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 the older generation this country is going to hell in a handbasket you know what's going to happen to these people and you know they became what was called the greatest generation, you know, kick fascist butt in World War II, you know, fabulous human beings. And 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 then my generation, you know, we we start, uh, we pioneer uh the, the sexual revolution, you know, we're we're living together, you know, without benefit of holy matrimony. And so what's gonna happen? And and you know, it worked. It worked. See, if they had trusted us. And, and if they had trusted their own parents. And, and, and so I start teaching this, and it makes so much sense that each generation kind of reinvents itself, and, and it works, and they're kind of carrying us further and further 
into this age of Aquarius where we have uh, a radical respect for human diversity and radical respect for human individuality. And each generation carries the torch a little bit further and each older generation sits there in judgment and worry and says the world's going to hell in a handbasket and these kids today, you know, and if I ever start sounding like that, shoot me, you know, trust the children. <laughs> wow, trust the children. I will remember that. I think that um, in order to do that, it does reflect, like in order to have that level of trust in children, as you say, it does reflect somebody who is willing to be open to um, sort of a more evolved understanding. I'm dog sitting right now. And so I'm oh. going to trust his wisdom. If ever he needs comfort, he will, he'll come and we'll work it into the thing. I wanted to start recording right off the bat because I know that once I start talking to you, it's like, there's so many gems that come out. So just in <laughs> case there was something that I wanted to edit into the video after or something. Gotcha. But one gem that won't come out is my cat. I locked my cat out. <laughs> oh gosh. You're like, I mean, I'm literally babysitting. It is not my dog. And so, you know, he's having a little bit of separation anxiety. And so that's uh -huh. why he's sticking really close. So I, you know, we are sensitive souls. We understand and, and want to comfort, don't we? Stephen Forrest, one of our great living legends, Stephen Forrest, you know, I adore you. I thank you so much, not just for this moment with you, but really you've inspired me in so many ways over the years before we even met. And you continue to not just inspire, but I feel like really raise the game where it comes to astrology, like to remind us that astrology can be a part of a journey towards greater love and greater wisdom if we choose so and if we set that intention. And I love that you are a very powerful reminder of that and so much more. Stephen, thank you. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thanks. It's been a pleasure, Nadia. And thank you so much for watching. And until we connect again, take care. Bye. Bye.